Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's edition of the Rich Urban Show. We bring you news and views from the unification principle point of view. Very happy to have on Mike Mood today. He's running for county commissioner in the Middleway District. And um, his opponent is Natalie Grantham Friend. So, yeah, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Mood. I'm running for the Middleway District seat for the Jefferson County Commission. Um, I've been a resident of Jefferson County full time since 1995. Um, since moving here, we've been involved in quite a few different activities over the years. Been uh, HOA operations in uh, on the mountain when I first moved up here in Westridge Hills, and um, I was also on the Jefferson County Little League board, where I held multiple positions, including uh, league president and league vice president, and really helped uh, change their operation to. Uh, something that was more profitable. Um, we own a couple of businesses here in Jefferson County. Uh, one of them we created from new, the other one we bought a business that was failing um, and successfully turned it around. And the uh, founding member and the chief of the Middleway Volunteer Fire Company since 2008. Okay. All right, great. Um, so like with the county commission election, Coming up, what do you think the most important issue is? Um, I think you were talking about the funding when we were talking about before, but go ahead and you know talk about that. The most important issue you think the county is facing right now? Unfortunately, it's not just one. There's so many. Um, funding is absolutely um, the main one. We, the county does not have the tax base that it needs to be able to provide what the citizens need for proper public safety, proper education, uh, parks and rec, everything is behind. And we are building and building and building houses in this county that are adding to the impact. Um, and the impact fees, which they are reviewing now and at today's commission meeting, uh, they did set a public hearing for it. Um, I would have to look at the date. I believe it was November the 12th, I believe, um, followed by the, the commission discussion and uh, possible voting and new ordinances to put that into place to increase the impact fee on uh, new construction to the county, which are the ones that are really creating the impact. Yeah. Uh, but, but, that's, but that's all part of it. Um, but I wanted to interject. Can I interject one thing? Is that... Sure. Yes, there are houses being built. Obviously, we see those, but also they have to pay the property taxes. So, Correct. wouldn't the funding automatically increase? So, you will get some funding that will increase, but housing is actually a, more of a burden on the tax base than what it provides in tax dollars. Um, so, that's why we've got to really focus on working uh, through our development authority, who has the new director. Uh, we need to really challenge her to find out where these people are working, the types of jobs they have, so that we can encourage those jobs to come here to Jefferson County. And the reason for that is because commercial growth actually pays a better tax base, that builds a better tax base than what residential growth does. Because your commercial growth, while it may not pay into education um, because it's not putting students into school, but the rest of what it builds as far as the tax base, it doesn't have as much of a load, meaning you're not seeing as many calls for service to the commercial establishments as what you would see for uh, residential. Things like fire, police, EMS, uh, parks and rec. The commercial doesn't have that big of a load on that. And when you combine the two of them together with your residential growth plus your commercial growth, you build a uh, more well-rounded tax base for the county. Okay, and in doing that, you could you could end up providing the better services for people without having to look at doing fees and levies as much to be able to help cover what the needs are. Yeah, about the the impact fees. So it appears that well, the school enrollment has been level and is protected to decline actually for public schools. So then the discussion was, I, I think we were both at that meeting some months ago that there wasn't any legal basis for impact fees because school enrollment wasn't increasing. And actually, I was recently 
It said in the paper, Spirit, that the enrollment increased 200, but I was just at the board meeting last Monday and looked at the figures they flashed up on the screen, and it was the same enrollment base as last year. So my point being, can we legally have impact fees because they're supposed to be for building schools and enrollment's not increasing? So, so as we look at that, yes, to a certain point you are correct, but we're actually overpopulating in our schools. Um, according to Kathy Skinner at the uh, was impact fee meeting, she made a presentation as part of that, that the state has a division that talks about what the school population or capacity could be compared to what its actual occupancy is. And it's 85% capacity is full. And the reason for that is because when they, you look at the occupancy of the school, you're counting in things like the gym, the auditorium, the cafeteria, rooms that aren't being used all day long. All of that helps to kind of balance out the occupancy number. But when you take that into calculations that the students are actually not in those rooms all day long at 85 percent, um, the schools at capacity. And she was reporting that uh, the high schools are at 102 percent capacity. Um, middle schools, I think, were just under the 85 and elementary just under 70 percent, I believe. Um, the middle and elementary numbers may be off, but the high school number, I'm, uh, she was saying, was 102 percent. So at this point, we are already behind in needing an additional high school in this county. Yeah. And with all the growth in housing, while registration may look like it's down at the moment, um, you're going to see a big boom in that because we're adding a lot of homes into this county. Yeah. And it's not a lot clear of because I think declining fertility rates and stuff like that. And also Correct. more people are sending kids to uh, – uh, private school or homeschooling, but anyway, that, that, is, that, yeah. is, that is correct. They're sending to private school, charter school, homeschool. So yes, it does it does affect the numbers to a certain point. Um, and when you're looking at it over a ten year period, as compared to let's say a five year period, it makes it much harder to project. Yeah, it's hard to project. So in a related topic, so we're talking about uh, a lot of our local taxes. I'm working on that issue. Is the excess levy um you know that's going to appear on the ballot again which is very non-transparent it's almost like 40 percent of our property tax but speaking about taxes some taxpayers <laughs> including me have properties that you know increased in one tax year 130 percent in value and i'm wondering if the commission and i do know about it because i've been working through some of those things like the border review and so on the commission sits as a border review but to me it seemed i went to the border review this year and it went it was very we'll call it perfunctory honestly i think it was kind of a kangaroo court honestly from my my experience is that they didn't really give sufficient oversight it's kind of rubber stamping in a way now some commissioners did have questions what the tax people were doing so i'm kind of being a little long-winded but what i'm getting at is should the county commission and doesn't it legally have authority to have more oversight of the tax collection in jefferson county or any other county i mean for that matter for local county commissions it doesn't seem like anybody's really watching the tax people you know policing them and the review of the border review was very insufficient, in my opinion. If I make any sense, could that be improved? Could we have more oversight? So I was talking about the fact that, you know, um, the border county commission sitting as a border review is supposed to review, you know, assessments. But I, I went to border review actually this year and it seemed kind of not a serious process where they really were able to dive into the facts and it's rushed, you know. They said, oh, we got to get this done. And then, you know, the chairman said, here's what we're offering you. And more or less, a couple commissioners had questions, but it's kind of like, okay. So in other words, I gave an extensive, uh, how do you say, presentation of my issue. And basically, 
that it wasn't seriously, you know, considered. And also in my research for the, uh, into more of the tax issue, well, my own issue was not just me. Obviously, everybody's paying property tax. Finding that there seems to be need for more oversight of the uh, tax office. So I'm wondering if the county commission sitting as a board of review, one, could that process be improved, and two, could they uh, have more oversight? I'm sure they could have more oversight. I know the assessor's office is uh, its own elected office. I'm not sure exactly what oversight they could have over her. Um, and unfortunately, housing values have just soared over the last couple of years um, to incredible rates in Jefferson County. Um, yeah. Well, what my experience is, although the, the uh, how do you say, the value of the house seems fairly, you know, stable. They go up. It might go up 10 or 15 percent. I found that both at my, you know, uh, I have a, a property in Westridge Hills, I think I mentioned last time, and I, I live in Shannondale. Well, in the last two years, both of those have skyrocketed in Westridge Hills. Vacant properties went up, not just mine, because I'm looking into it thoroughly. Uh, all the owners there who had vacant properties next to house went up 130%. That's right, double plus. And in Shannondale, it went up like, I think, 70% the year before last for uh, values of uh, not just vacant, but of land. And I was looking into it more and see if this is really the rates that the market, how do you say, are those really the real rates that people are going to pay? Like up here, is someone going to pay $90,000 for an empty lot? And the answer is, I don't think so. So something's fishy, and it needs to be looked into. And the county Oops. commission sits as a board of review, so I'm wondering if, if that can be in, and it should be investigated. Well, I, unfortunately, the pricing is skyrocketing like that, and it's, it's astonishing. As I sit and see rates that people are paying for some properties that where I've heard friends looking for yeah. property, but when I, they I, talk about it, it's... And it's just astonishing that, I mean, you're right. And, and depending on what area you're talking about for $90,000 for, um, but yeah, I, I saw one that went on dark lane, um, half acre lot with, had water and septic on it. That was at $90,000. And I, I couldn't believe it was at that, but it sold in like days. But and overall though, well, anyway, not to belabor it too much. Right. Uh, I think it needs looking. I'm wondering. So, I don't disagree might, with you. I don't disagree with you. Look into it. So. It needs a lot more, a more review. I think the commissioners, in my opinion, by my own experience, didn't take it seriously enough, and it was more. Uh, I know, of course, there was a lot going on with the commission, you know, this year, but it's more. Uh, for, how do you say, just kind of a rubber stamp. It's kind of like it wasn't really based on what I was saying. Yeah, was, just like I was, I was at that meeting you're talking about. And, and yeah, that, I, yeah, I mentioned I some of tend to agree with you. It, it certainly did look like a very quick rubber stamp to move forward. Yeah, so and so that's one thing. But um, so as far as tax, tax assessments and um, yeah. Well, we were talking about, yeah, like – Talking about the commission, I mean, we've had the unusual situation this year where two commissioners were were kicked out. We talked about that on the show previously, but if you want to recap more your opinion about that, I felt, you know, just to say my opinion first. So our commissioners that were kicked out, you know, Kraus and Jackson, did they make some mistakes? Yeah, I think they made some mistakes. Did they delay county business? Yeah, I think they delay county business. But should they have been removed from the office? The overwhelming opinion I hear is no. That seems like people were pushing a commit a political agenda. But what's your take on it? I, I don't disagree with you. I've heard a lot of people that are unhappy with the fact they were removed. Um, at this point, I, we're past it, and we've got to move forward, and we've got to get get this commission working in a positive and a positive manner because it's just at the present time we've got 
um, two commissioners that are elected, two that are appointed, one seat is vacant. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting this election passed and we are going to have people that are back in here that are voted in. Um, I'm not happy that we're in a spot that we've had people removed. They were voted in. Um, and uh, there's, there's just been a lot of turmoil over everything. And I'm ready to move forward in a positive manner and help get this county back moving forward. Okay. So I've been looking into some, you know, we've had this conference of pan process. And it seems to me there hasn't been much discussion, I think it's on purpose, uh, about the solar issue. To me, right now, that's either the number one or one of the top issues. And I don't see it, you know, I'm sure that's quite intentional, really on the agenda of the Planning Commission. And it needs to be. I still think we need to restrict, as it was before, solar development. What's your take on it? So I, I will start out. I was much softer on solar early on, um, listening to farmers and hearing what farmers talk about their needs were. Um, but that being said, hearing what the rest of the county was talking about, um, what their needs are and what this is doing to their property values, what it's doing to um, stormwater management, uh, there's a lot more to it than what some initially thought that were more favorable for it, and myself included. And as, as I've learned more about it, my opinion has gotten a lot different. And I think that going through the comprehensive plan, I think we need to put it as conditional use instead of permitted use. And we need to go out here and actually start putting some ordinances on them to restrict them some. Um, well, you said, I'm, I'm sorry, do I want to tell the farmer, no, you can't do this, that, or the other on your land? I don't like that idea either. But when what he's doing on his land adversely affects the neighbors, that's a problem. And some of the ways to cure that are with conditions. If he's going to do that, then we can start talking about setbacks that he's got to have to be able to do that. Um, currently, you can have these solar panels right up almost 50 feet off of a property line. Um, right. I think that there should be more in the four or 500 feet. Um, and I think there should be a sufficient barrier of trees and greenery that's right. growing in ahead of it. And they shouldn't be removing the topsoil because when they remove the topsoil, there's no way for you to have decent grass to grow back around it. Um, so we've got to find ways to make it work for everybody. Would it uh, still be a per primary permitted use? I think, right, so the way the Testament changed it is it's permitted without, permitted anywhere not in the, how do you say, it's permitted in the urban growth area, and it's, it's a, can be also in the non-urban growth area. But before that change was made, it wasn't considered or permitted use. I may not be using the exact right language, but I think right. you know what I'm saying. Should we change it back? So it's, you know, it's not a permitted use in general like it used to be? I, I agree. I think we should not put it back to where it's just a permitted use. <clears throat> because that's what happens. If it's just a permitted use, there's no review on it. There's no um, hearings on it. It's just permitted use. They go in, uh, provide their permits for it, and then move forward. Uh, if it's conditional use, you can start putting restrictions on it. And I think we need to look at ordinances on it and write ordinances on it to make it very clear if this is what they want to do with their property, um, these are what the things they're going to have to do to be able to do it. Yeah. Um, it could be. There's ideas. Like I was reading a paper someone did on it, you know, because this is obviously not just an issue here in other rural counties. And, you know, like, would anybody object to having a solar farm on the county dump? I wouldn't. Who cares? I mean, you know, or maybe there was, uh, I think the Millville Quarry wanted a, so a solar thing over there. Probably wouldn't care about that. That's not exactly prime farmland, you know, like the quarry after they used it or something. But, right. well, the, you the, know. The solar, part of the solar location is, 
its proximity to your power lines. Um, yeah. So like the, the dump, let's say, um, or other farmland that's not along the, the transmission lines, um, that's not feasible that's because true. if they were put it in there, then you would have to you know wire it all the way to the transmission lines. Unless that's it's a not- smaller one. I think there's some areas, I forget the giga, not gigawatts, megawatts, where you would just have it like adjacent to a substation. But it's not like, not big, not like Blake Solar Farm where it's 500 acres. It's smaller, so it would just go out from that substation. Right. Well, the problem is that solar, to be able to provide any real useful, usable power, takes up a massive footprint. That's why they're taking up so much space to create such a small amount of power. Yeah, it's just not a very good deal. And I, I never hear people talking about, well, hello, over here it's cloudy 55% of the time. So who, what's the brilliant idea of putting a solar panel here? This isn't like Mesa, Arizona or something. I don't get it. Well, that's correct. And my understanding is there's also a calculation into that, that you have to have X number of panels to have X number of um, power produced by it. And the uh, overcast or the uh, daylight hours are all figured into that, which is there again, part of why you have so much of a footprint of solar compound to be able to make it anywhere near feasible. Yeah. So over half the time it's producing, I think something like 20% of capacity if it even produces ever the full capacity, even when it's sunny. So Correct. it doesn't make any sense. Honestly, I think it's a land of money grab by those who own those things, not things, the land, I, I think, that, you know. I think it is too. Um, they, they are taking what's paying the best. And unfortunately, the reason it's paying the best is solar has a lot of federal subsidy that goes into being able to do or produce solar plants. Um, so if we didn't have those government dollars going into that, these solar compounds would not be able to offer the incredible, incredible amounts of money that they're offering these farmers for the, the, the land. Yeah. To, say, uh, to answer, talk about one related thing, like I know that the council, not council, commission just killed the pilot for the, um, I want to say Turkey Hill. That's probably not Windy. right. For the that yeah. that one, so would you support pilot agreements for stuff like that, or you think that for that solar, was- absolutely not. The, okay. the, only, the only reason a pilot program makes sense is the pilot program was designed for companies that were going to bring in multiple jobs, and multiple is not three or four. Multiple right. is there. It was designed for, for companies that were going to bring in a hundred or more jobs to the county, right? Uh, long-term okay. jobs and the solar compounds they're bringing in a lot of workers short term while they build but then they're only three or four workers during the rest of their life of the project so for something like that absolutely not that makes zero sense okay uh, would I look at a pilot program for something that brought a lot of jobs to this county absolutely as long as it made sense it can't be for the entire life of the project which is what they wanted it should be something that's a five or a 10 year pilot program for a company that's bringing in a large number of jobs that's paying its taxes in other ways. And the solar compounds just aren't that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, about the fire service. So you're the, uh, you're the, you're the fire chief in middle way, right? That's correct. Yes. So I know that the, Commission just turned down putting a levy for the, I believe it's for fire departments. You explain, maybe you could explain it more. So, yes. Pending a study, did they do the right thing? And what would be your plan for fire service going forward? Well, first off, they they have told us in the fire service for decades that you're going to have to find somewhere else to get the money. And then they told us, yeah, you're going to have to do a fee or you're going to have to do a levy. So we spent about two years working on a fee uh, several years ago. And when it came to the commission, the commissioners looked at it and said, absolutely not. We will not do a fee because that means 
we as commissioners would have to vote yes to put a tax on our residents. And that's not acceptable. Um, we want it to be a levy. Uh, a fee, the county would have had, the county government would have had the money coming into them and they would have dispersed the money. Um, so when they said it that way, we went ahead and started working towards a levy. A levy is harder to do because a levy has to actually go on the ballot. Um, the Fire and Rescue Association worked with um, fire companies from other counties in the state of West Virginia and drew up a fire levy call that is the same as it is in other counties in the state. So we knew that it kind of passed muster in the state and was allowed. Um, we submitted that to the county to try to get on the ballot. Uh, we we're hoping to get it on the ballot for the primary election. Um, that did not happen. Um, so we were hoping to get it on for the general. Uh, as they reviewed it, one of the things they did not like was the fact that the county did not have the control of the money. And as they put it, the Fire and Rescue Association had the control of the money. Well, the Fire and Rescue Association didn't have control of the money. All the Fire and Rescue Association did was tell the county commission whether the fire companies met the standard. The county held the money, but it was laid out in the levy call how the money would be distributed. Um, and the Fire and Rescue Association distributed, would ha have it distributed in, um, first off, straight across the board by seven companies got X amount of dollars. Then the rest went on geographical area, uh, how many square miles that particular fire company had, and the uh, remaining portion was on call volume. Um, and then there was also a fairly large chunk about a quarter of a million, I believe, that was going to be given back to the uh, emergency services agency to try to help staff in there. Um, they didn't like the way that was written. Um, they wanted more control over it, more oversight of the money, uh, which they really, they have. Um, they just didn't like the way it was, it was written. So they kicked it back for a study. Well, we can keep spending monies on study and spending money on studies all we want. We are way behind in fire service and... Um, I think when the study finally comes out, it's going to show that that we're way behind in that. And we're going to be right back to square one again. We keep putting it back to square one every time it gets to a point to move forward with it. Do I like the idea of a fee or levy? No, I don't. Um, I would rather have the tax base here in the county that we didn't need to have that. But we don't have that here in the county, so we have to come up with something because the operation of fire companies is skyrocketing in cost and it's not increasing in income. Um, so are we able to keep a, the volunteer or is our fire system now a hundred percent volunteer? It's combination really. It's, it's technically it's volunteer, but the stations that have ambulances in them, um, those staffing from ESA are cross trained and can get on the fire apparatus in that station. The stations that do not have ambulances in them, they are completely volunteer. So is that good? Is that workable going forward? Are there enough volunteers volunteering? It depends on the station. Um, some stations do very well. Middleway does very well. Um, we've had a lot of change in policies that have made it more friendly to the newer generations, um, which has increased our membership quite a bit. Um, we have maintained a, an EMS service at a middle way through a rapid response program, uh, which keeps our call volume up, which call volume up on the EMS side. With them running all these calls, it keeps people interested. If they weren't running the calls, they wouldn't be interested, and then you start losing members. Um, so some stations are doing well with it, other stations not quite so well. Well, in a related question, like... Over here in Shannondale and Mission Road area, we have, I'm not sure exact population. It could be up to 6,000 or more people just down Mission Road. And we're down, I think our firehouse there at Mission Road isn't really staffed now at all. But what I'm thinking, anyway, what I'm getting to is should we have a, or could we, should we, and also with the limited access to the mountain from only Mission Road, should we have, in the long run, like a firehouse down in Shannondale toward the lake area or something like that? Because it's, it's not served so well 
Right now, it's equidistant from Citizens and Blue Ridge Mountain on Keys Gap. And there's a lot, a lot of population in that area. And it's not well serviced, it seems. What do you think? I would agree with you. Uh, it's not well serviced. But the problem we have is the system that we have in this county. Um, it's a the base fire service is a volunteer system. Uh, the county is working towards getting their FDID number. Um, they are working towards putting in a station um, out more towards the Bardane area. Um, that's not going to help the mountain. Um, right. The problem with the mountain is that that's a volunteer system, just like most of the rest of the stations are. Um, putting a station out into Shenandoah, that would have to be a decision by the Blue Ridge Fire Company to add a third station or to add or to move their substation further down. But a substation, when they have a main station and a substation, that's running two facilities off of one income. And so Blue Ridge is, is running two facilities off of one income. And that creates a financial issue for them. Um, the, the creation of another volunteer fire company, that's a whole other issue. You would have to have a group of people that were willing to start it, that were willing to find the funding to be able to create it. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues that, that come up in doing that. Um, the call volume towards the Shannondale side is certainly higher than the call volume towards the Keys Gap side, um, and maybe it's something that they should look at as far as station location. Should they look at building a new station in Shannondale and having that be their main station? Um, but that's all that's all decisions that are made by Blue Ridge Fire Company mm. that the county or the state really don't have any hands in. Okay. Well, yeah. Anyway, something that's well, on the same topic, you know, except for political candidates talking about it doesn't seem to get a lot of traction, but um so we have all this population. And we have a two-lane road. That's it. It's not like if you were, if they were to say now these, you know, if this was a new subdivision, you say, okay, we're going to have five thousand people plus whatever. I don't actually know. It's got to be more than five thousand. And we have this one two-lane road, so we want to build there. And the county will say, oh, sure, go ahead. No way, they wouldn't allow that. So what I'm trying to say is, there needs to be some other exit south or cross the river or, and then you know that's you know um something that it may be a state issue too but i think local like the commission would have to lobby for it do you think that's needed or something that needs to be actually more on the burner it's absolutely needed because when something happens out mission road it's yeah it completely blocks it there's no other way out um, when you get bad weather up there, when you get more than about two or three inches of snow on the ground, you're going to have an accident on Mission Road, and it shuts it down, and it can very easily shut it down for hours. And while it's shut down, anybody has a medical emergency, a police emergency, needs fire service further in, they're blocked, and there's no way to get them in and out of there. Um, I'm not really sure who's responsibility it would be to find another way in or out. Uh, one of the problems you've got is the road structure's already in. Um, so you're now having to start talking about um, the state taking over land and homes to be able to build a new bridge and a new road to find another way off the mountain. Yeah, there's several possibilities. I think that it should start with a feasibility study of different routes and, and so on. It would clearly involve state funding and whatever. But I mean, I was just over in Berkeley Springs. And they built this huge bypass, and I don't know how many hundreds of millions. It's not even that busy an area. I mean, anyway, point is, if there's a will, there's a way. So it needs to get a lot more attention. It, it does. I agree. It, it needs more attention. Um, the mountain is very often forgotten about. Um, and I say, at Mission Road, there's one way in, one way out. Virginia, last I heard, has no interest in having uh, Mission Road continue on through into Virginia. Um, it's pretty well a trail that goes through at this point. Right. Um, they don't really have a way they want them coming out over there. But I think maybe that's something as commissioners we should look at the 
Department of Highways and say we need to figure out something else. Yeah. Well, it's probably, yeah. Agreed. Probably three possibilities. One that you mentioned. Also, then you know the river is right there. You could it require a bridge crossing over and be near um uh Table Town Road. Table Town, right. And then yeah. actually the part of West Virginia is that isolated part. And there's yes. like a power line runs there already. Now, could you build a road there? I don't know. Or maybe some kind of road or emergency egress, but that's also, I guess, possible, you know. Right. That's all Department of Highways, but but it's something that should be looked at. Because yeah, that's correct. We do have part of uh, West Virginia that's only accessible through Virginia. Um, and it's, yeah. But the main problem is you've got all these people that are into that area, and they're still building a lot of houses back there. And so we're adding uh people that area yeah and we're not doing anything to widen the road to find another way out um and there's yes. really i don't think there's no widening widening the road without taking out a lot of homes to do it yeah or even just having another exit it. yeah yeah it needs to be a uh, studied it's maybe there's no easy answer but just doing nothing is not sufficient. i agree there's no easy answer but you're right i don't i think doing nothing is not really the answer either Okay. All right. Well, we're probably coming toward the conclusion. So as far as, you know, you're running against Natalie Grantham Friend and um, anything you'd like to say, like any issues we didn't talk touch on, just that you want to talk about, or how would you like to differentiate yourself from your opponent and anything like that, feel free to go ahead. Well, one of the things we haven't talked about is with all these people that are coming here, um, We've got a child care problem. Um, there is nowhere near enough child care in this county for the people that are living here as it is now. Um, my understanding to the studies now, it's talking about a 13-month wait to get into the average daycare center. Um, you've, got wow. to, you've got to start scheduling daycare before you get pregnant. Yeah, that's not, that doesn't make any sense. Um, mm. So we've got to start working on something to encourage daycare. Um, opportunities in the county. And I think there, again, that comes to the development authority um, to start talking to some of the bigger daycare centers to try to encourage them to come. And maybe we need to look at some way to work on some classes for people that would be interested in expanding a business into doing either in-home daycare. Um, that's now a new tax base for them, tax base for the county. Um, and we could do that as something as simple as let's look at what the classes are that are required to do daycare center, let's start putting these classes on within the county. If we need to find ways to fund that uh, to help fix this problem, I think we need to find that money because there are a lot of people that would have that ability to do in-home daycare um, that may not. And that's an expansion of business growth in the county. That's an expansion of daycare mm -hmm. in the county and a reduction in the amount of time that it takes to get your children into daycare. And there again, that creates local jobs. And yeah, a lot that's of that, true. what I'm talking about is creating local jobs. Okay. Um, local jobs create uh, the ability of people to stay in this county to work. Staying in this county to work gives them more time to spend with their family, more time to spend with their churches or other civic organizations mm -hmm. that they would like to be a part of, all of which benefit this county. Um, so that's a direction that we, I feel that we really have got to work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but, and indirectly or directly it's related to, well, another issue that's close to my heart about, you know, helping the, that a lot of societal issues are related to the fact that like 50% of children are now born outside of marriage. So then probably that's also further stressing the daycare because you're, have a single parent or grandparents. Well, grandparents wouldn't need daycare, but there anyway, there's a lot of, it's a lot less stable. And then also you have the situation, if you don't have two parents, if one parent did want to stay home, then if there's only one, that's not an option. You see what I'm saying? Correct. And, and the fact that a lot of the jobs that are here are not great paying jobs. Um, so when people look at daycare and daycare is costing them 
anywhere from three to four hundred, four hundred fifty dollars a month, or excuse me, a week to do, and they're working at sheets for sixteen dollars an hour. That's not making enough money to pay for the daycare. Yeah, um, it's not. Yeah, you know, so there again, that's why we've got to work on creating job growth here. Um, and it, everything really comes back, I think, to job growth. And yeah. we have to look at many different ways to grow jobs here and bring good businesses here. Um, and when I say good businesses, I mean businesses that pay decent wages. Um, having a new McDonald's, having a new Taco Bell, that's nice. Yeah, they don't pay very well. And right. they don't, yeah, you know, those are more jobs that help benefit the other businesses that are here. Um, you know, not discrediting them and not saying negative about their employees, but it's it's just they're not living and we're making living wages working there. Um, and those are the kind of jobs we really need to uh, encourage yeah. to come here. But would you, getting back to what I was saying, I'm not disagreeing with you, but if we had more stable family structure, then that would be another option because if the husband or in some cases the wife was working and making a decent salary, then like you say, they kind of do the math, okay, you know, sure. it'd be better for one parent just to stay home, you know? Oh, I, I don't disagree. I've been lucky enough when we moved here, that was why we moved. My wife, we all stay home with our kids. And, you know, because I, because I went to a vocational high school. I learned a trade that has turned into a business, and it's done me very well. That's the other thing we should be looking at here. Um, the Board of Education should be looking at additional trade schools, um, trade schools that have evening hours. Um, I've got one of my one of my employees that I would like to be able to send to a technical school. Yeah, he'd work. He'd go to school Monday through Friday during the daytime. I would lose him for almost a year uh, for him to be able to do that. But if it had it in the evenings, I could pay for him to go to school in the evenings um, instead of during the day. And he could make a salary during the day and go to school in the evenings for that. But we don't have any options like that here. Yeah, that's a good so point. Are, those are things that we should be trying to, yeah, uh, Board of Education should be looking at trying to do. Um, where there, again, that could be an expansion of business into the county. Um, you could have vocational centers that could, could come into the county and work. Yeah, I agree. That's a good a good thing to look into. Okay, daycare. Anything else you want to share about? That's a... uh, I think we've pretty well hit there. The biggest thing I said is really is business growth. We we have got to bring business into this town, and it needs to go into properly zoned areas and. Our residents have got to be willing to accept business to come in. Does that mean accept at all? Not necessarily. Um, but we have to look at what's going to bring business here. We have to look at what's going to build tax base here, what's going to build jobs here, um, and not fight every business that wants to come into town. Yeah. Do you think the Rockwell thing, I know that's history now, but was a good decision or was was a bad uh, for the whatever encouragement of the Development Commission to bring that? Well, it makes it very hard for the development authority to try to attract people here when, and not just Rockwell, when when businesses see Rockwell, when they see solar, when they see things like that to come in here or try to come in and all the fighting the residents are doing, it makes them question, is that a place we really want to go? Um, and then when you look at how difficult the county can be to build in, uh, there's a lot of red tape in Jefferson County uh, pulling permits and site development there's a lot of work to do here that other counties deeper into west virginia don't necessarily have as much of um and all that additional stuff you have to do is added to the investment to come yeah i guess the more bigger question is what kind of kind of growth i mean i think we have a very you know pretty or beautiful county so i mean tourism is an important area too so I think well, especially the solar is a slap in the face. <laughs> Welcome to uh, Jefferson County. Buddy. Here's your beautiful Blake solar farm. Isn't it really nice? Right. And and that's where if we can start encouraging vineyard expansion into Jefferson County. Uh, we've already had some change in our state codes that will allow uh, the expansion of tasting rooms and distillation uh, into the county. So there again, that's other tax dollars that can come. 
But as we're looking at tourism, tourism is nice, but for the most part, tourism, a lot of the, the workers for tourism are seasonal work. Um, their salaries are okay. Are they, are they great? I'm not really positive they are. Um, they're doing well for them. Um, but a lot of that work is seasonal work. What do they do in the off season? Um, we need to create jobs here that are year round. And that's what I say. If we if we task the development authority with looking at the people that are coming here, where are you, what kind of work do you do? Who do you work for? And that way we can look at that and say, yeah, we have X percentage of our people that are in this kind of a work. This is the kind of businesses that we need to try to attract here. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think there's got to be a, a way we can do a study on that to figure out. And I, I'm not always a huge person of studies, but yeah, that's a study I think I would support is trying to figure out where these people are going to work and what kind of work they do so we can attract that here. Um, if these people could spend more time at home uh, and in their home county working, that's a lot of additional money for them because if they're not spending four hours a day, five hours a day commuting, um, even if their salary was slightly less than what it was four hours, you know, three hours from here, uh, if they're not spending all that time away from home, that's actually the same amount of money. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, but we have to look at these businesses and see what, what are they doing and how do we encourage them to come here? And we've got to make this county seem more welcoming to business growth. And that, yeah, I think, okay. is really a better problem because we're not very well uh, liked as far as business growth. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and then there's the overarching issues like we we're talking about. I mean, a lot of more than a few people, and of course, this is, uh, isn't only Jefferson County, are not in the workforce at all. And that affects overall thing because that means they're not in the tax base. I mean, That's imagine if everybody was working. I mean, I don't know the exact figure, but it could be 20 or 30 percent of young men or maybe young women aren't even in the workforce because of whatever substance abuse, alcohol abuse, non-workforce, or they're like, you know, maybe they take are somewhat doing uh, labor here or there. I think you know what I'm saying. Or opioid problem. Well, correct. Opioid problem. Drugs are a problem, period. Yeah. A lot of places find that they have a hard time finding employees now that are that aren't using some kind of a drug. Um, and some of it's marijuana, and some places have a huge fit over it, others do not. Um, yeah, but you're right. We need to get people into the workforce. And part of the way of getting them into the workforce is we need to have them have job training to be able to get there. Um, places like, you know, like James Rumsey, the schools barely even talk about it. I've had uh, three of my four boys went to Rumsey. Um, two of them have trades that they got from Rumsey. One was adult education. One was in high school. Um, but two of them have uh, jobs making very good money with the education they got at vocational schools. Uh, and I think that's something the Board of Education should really be encouraging more. Yeah, I agree. Like, that's that's not a commission for you, um, but that's right. something... That uh, the Board of Education should be looking at. That's true. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I've been looking into excess levy. I oppose that because it's 40% of our tax and most of it's going to the bloated office. I'm going to be writing about more on that on our website. It's a lot of, a lot of office staff seems to be getting added and not a lot of teaching staff. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I've got some reports. I have, I'm going to dive into it. But like it says on the levy, oh, we're supporting nurses, whatever. Well, I got a got a, a email back from the superintendent. So you know how many nurses the levy supporting school mm -hmm. nurses? Half of one. Your twenty five million a year levy is supporting one half of one nurse. So a lot of it's false advertising. Anyway, I'll be writing more about that in the coming weeks. But right. Yeah, I haven't seen. They really haven't said much in this levy. Um, in past years, they've said. More about what the levy is for. I think they're just hoping it will. Well, they don't tell what it's been spent on, but I, I'm trying to bring some light to it. So I, I urge people to vote against it. That's not, I mean, the purview, like you said, of the commission. But anyway, right. it's a big issue. It's a lot of our tax money, 40%. Well, and, and, and as a commissioner, they, not only should I focus on commission things, 
Um, you need to know more about what goes on on things other than just commission item things. Right. So you can be well versed in kind of the county as a whole. Uh, and then you can make recommendations to, while it may not be an official, yeah, but you can make recommendations to others, you know, what can help, what can, you know. So you, you have to kind of know the whole thing um, that goes on in the county uh, in running for commission seat. Yeah, it's all, it is interrelated. Well, yeah. wow, great. We had a good discussion. I thank you very much for coming on today. We'll put this out again on uh, uh, podcast and video. And as we know, every vote counts. <laughs> Absolutely. So, counts. <laughs> so yeah, I do so make your choice coming up on November 5th or if you vote early. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.